Hello everyone this is the finale of what if Naruto had a proper teacher, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Jiraiya winced slightly as the medical nin healed his scorched shoulder. He had not expected pain because his mind was elsewhere. Now that he was aware that the healing wasn't going to be completely painless he focused his features. It wouldn't do to show weakness. He had been thinking of the assassination attempts. It could have gone much worse. Anko had been the first target, which really was rather foolish of Kumogaku. She dealt with the assassin and then alerted him by activating a Fuinjutsu seal. The alert went out and he and his Anbu were ready when the attack struck. The shinobi they fought were strong. They were at least a rank but also had some nasty kinjutsu that packed quite a punch. Jiraiya had been injured, as had Yugao. Her left hand was almost unrecognizable and without Sunad on hand to handle the recovery it was likely the nerve damage would be too great for it to be salvaged. Fortunately she was a kenjutsu expert not an ninjutsu specialist so her career as a kunoiki could still continue. The other three Anbu guards who had been with him were not so lucky and they had perished. The Hokage hated thinking about it this way, but ultimately, taking down a dozen Kinjutsu assassins was more than a fair trade. Other targets had also been hit. They were after Shikaku and he had survived, sadly his wife had not. Shikamaru had taken it particularly hard and all of the Nara clan was in mourning. Danzo had also been attacked but the old bastard didn't have a single scratch on him. A couple of his root agents had fallen to an explosive rate and attack, but those were the only casualties. News from Omegakur was mixed. They had lost several shinobi, among them Kakashi. Losing the genius sensei of Team 7 was a devastating blow. The fact that he went out fighting the legendary Madara Uchiha was mind-boggling. Your name will live on. You've done more than me and Sunad combined to help Kanoa. The treachery of Suna was also troubling. He had already received a missive from the Kazekage indicating he had known nothing of the betrayal and asking for a meeting to explain. He had put that issue to the side for now. The Akatsuki had been eradicated. Kanoa no longer had the nine-tailed beast but they now had the functionally brain-dead comatose Jinchuriki of the Rokubi, Nanabi and the Hachibi. But what to do with them? He had the Fuinjutsu expertise needed to seal them into hosts if that was the path he wanted to take. He could return the Rokubi to Kirigakur and the Nanabi to Takagakur, but should he? The power of three Jinchuriki could be what was needed to maintain the peace and stop the endless fighting. He certainly wouldn't be returning the Hachibi to Kumo. With all this going on he couldn't forget that Hai no Kuni was in chaos. Kumo had wrecked an incredible amount of carnage on the capital and the country was functionally leaderless. Danzo was pushing for him to take over as the Daimyo and the Hokage and Usher in a new era where there would be no conflicting rule between a nation and its hidden village. Kami what a mess. It would solve a lot of problems and cause many more. The other Daimyo would immediately feel threatened and we might have every single country of the elemental nations calling out for blood. Worst of all would be the amount of paperwork the cage Daimyo would have to face. He wished Kakashi was still alive. He would have good advice on these matters. Shikaku was his other advisor but he was loath to call on him when he had just lost his spouse. Thoughts of that turned to Sunad. How close had he been to losing her? Too close. She was going to be returning soon along with his godson and the rest of Team 7. Jiraiya decided not to make any firm decisions. It had always been his intention to make Naruto the next Hokage so he should be in on these critical nation-shaping choices. Asterisk break asterisk. Tezuka Yotsuki, the god I'm Rakage was afraid. The attack on the capital of Hai no Kuni had been a success, but the assault on Kanoa had been an abject failure. None of the targets had been killed and the leadership of his hated enemy was as strong as ever. And the cost, the cost had been high. The entirety of the Kinkaku force had been destroyed. Hundreds of lesser shinobi had been sacrificed to fuel their kinjutsu and it had all been for naught. The one bright spot was news of the death of Hataki. He had been a thorn in Kumo's side for some time. Sadly on the balance that was not sufficient. Kumo had been gutted of its most skilled shinobi in the course of the war. There was no one who could stand up to the monsters of Konohagakur. Namikas, Uchiha, 
Haruno, Jiraiya, Sunad, Shimura. Every name listed had the power to devastate entire teams of Kumo Nin. The one saving grace was that he believed he had time. With Hai no Kuni in disarray it was unlikely they would begin a fresh assault. He hoped. If they did choose to attack he would be left with little else but Chunan and Jenin to fight with. Damn the Mizukage, can she not see the danger we are all in? Kanoa must be stopped or we will all be under their yoke. Kirigakur had been devastated by their blood purges. In the past several years however they were virtually untouched by the war all around them. Every other village had suffered atrocious casualties in one way or another. Her fresh troops could be enough. If only she could see the danger. The knot of panic continued to grow. If he couldn't convince her to ally with him Kumo was doomed. Be it now or a year from now there simply wasn't time to train Shinobi to become Jonan, let alone the S-ranked titans that Kanoa had. And so with little hope he wrote another letter to the Mizukage promising her everything he could think of. Full war spoils of Kanoa. Any Biju captured. Carte blanche for her Shinobi to be within Kaminari no Kuni. Anything and everything. Whatever it took. Asterisk break asterisk. Naruto was still in a daze. Sakura and Sasuke had told him what happened. Told him how Sunid was going to sacrifice herself for him and how Kakashi did it instead. He wanted to rage at her and his fallen sensei. He wanted to be Hokage. That meant he was the one who died to protect the village, not the other way around. And yet how could he be upset with someone who was willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice for him? How could he be upset with them for giving Sakura hope? It was a maddening tumultuous storm of emotions raging through him. As bad as he had it soon it was worse. She was morose and guilt-ridden. It was her jutsu that Kakashi had copied that had gotten him killed. It was her choice to leave the village and only train one apprentice in the life-giving medical jutsu that could help so many people. Naruto shook his head at the weight of guilt that was so clearly on her shoulders. They were nearing Kanoa now where they would report to Jiraiya. Once more Naruto felt guilty for being relieved that he didn't have to report that Sunid had lost his life for him. But it had been at the cost of Kakashi. The man who had molded him into the shinobi he was today. The man who had taught him that the village came first and that foolish pride had no place on his team. The man who had given him the skills and power to fulfill his dream. Sakura moved closer to him. Naruto, don't blame yourself. You did everything you could. Naruto looked at his love. I know Sakura-chan. I know. Kakashi wouldn't want us to think about the past outside of the lessons we can learn from it. I'm sick of this war and all the fighting. I want people to stop dying already. Kumo is the last threat Naruto. Once they are dealt with we can have peace. Naruto thought about that. It sounded nice but he wasn't sure it was true. The shinobi world seemed wedded to warfare. That didn't mean he wouldn't try. He knew he had the strength to make peace a reality, at least in the short term. He no longer had the QB in his gut but his chakra reserves were still massive. More importantly he still retained his skill and knowledge. He could now enter sage mode in an instant and he could continually gather natural chakra while he fought. The endless reserves he used to summon hundreds and hundreds of cage bunshin along with the mightiest of the toads was no longer there however, although he could still easily summon a hundred cage bunshin if needed. Kakashi had taught him to always do an honest self-assessment of his skills and he knew he was either the strongest or second strongest shinobi Konohagakur had. His brother in all but blood may be stronger now, maybe. Suzanu was the ultimate power of the Sharingan and it was a pain to deal with. If he ever had to fight him he would give himself the slight edge in terms of endurance. He knew he was better with the blade even with the Sharingan giving Sasuke its predictive power. He had matched Madara in Kenjutsu and Madara was faster and stronger than Sasuke. It doesn't matter who is the strongest really. We are brothers. And with Madara dead I don't see another opponent able to match us. Naruto thought back to the power of the Rinnegan. Had they been more careful with destroying Madara at the end they might have recovered those eyes. It was risky since they didn't have enough information to know the full extent of its power. They had obliterated Madara's head as well as his entire body after he had decapitated the ancient Uchiha. His thoughts drifted back to Kakashi as he tried to etch every lesson he had been taught by the shinobi. Naruto had many memories, more so than any person alive thanks to the frequent use of the cage bunshin. Of all those memories he would make sure to never lose the ones that had his sensei in them. Asterisk break asterisk. 
Kankuro forced his broken body to move. It was going to be a long journey back to Suna. When he got there he was done. He was going to tell off Baki and Temari and get the hell away from Sunagakur. He had fought with Kanoa and against them. You couldn't stop them. Why did you do it? Why did you doom our village you idiots? The puppeteer thought angrily. Slowly but surely he made his journey to Suna. He only hoped that Kanoa's vengeance hadn't already turned it into a smoking ruin by the time he got there. Asterisk break asterisk. Sunid and Jiraiya were finally alone after the debriefing. It wasn't your fault Sunid Haim. Sunid angrily shook her head. It was my fault. I only trained Shizun and after she died I never bothered to get another apprentice or write down my jutsu. He died because I failed to do my duty. Jiraiya knew she was right but what purpose did that serve? Let's pretend you're right. What do you want to do now? Sunid's eyes burned with determination. I'll do what I should have done before. I will take on multiple apprentices. I will put to scroll the techniques I have created. Kakashi's death won't have been in vain. Jiraiya nodded. Then Kakashi's sacrifice wasn't wasted. He would be happy knowing that the village is stronger because of something he did. Regardless of the circumstances that led up to it all we can do now is honor his memory and push forward. Sunid squeezed her eyes shut as tears rolled down her cheeks. Her Jiraiya was right. Kakashi would want the village to be strong and she would help it be strong. She opened her eyes and saw the concern and affection on Jiraiya's face. She knew she could make Kanoa strong by passing on her legacy to her apprentices. She would do that, certainly. There was also another way she could keep Kanoa strong. Sunid was the last of the Senju. Normally she would be long past childbearing age but she was the greatest medical nin alive. Regeneration could come in many forms and she decided in that moment that she and Jiraiya would carry on her grandfather's legacy. She kissed him and whispered her plans into his ear. And if it was a boy, she would name him Kakashi. Asterisk break asterisk. Mei Terumi had shared the scroll with her advisors. There were multiple opinions about the Rakage's offer. Some thought it was the perfect opportunity, praising her for waiting until the right moment to ally with Kumo and reap the largest rewards. Fawning sycophants, she thought with disgust. Others were more wary and thought the terms were too generous to ever be agreed to. They debated it while Mei stayed silent and kept her own counsel. Finally she cleared the room. This is my decision and I had better make the right one. Less than two decades ago Kumo and Kiri were involved in a bitter war. Now the rakage was figuratively on his knees begging for an alliance. It was funny how quick the tides of war can change opinions. She didn't trust Jiraiya. And yet Kanoa as a whole had stood by its allies. They had stood up for Takagaku when Iwa had threatened it and it had nearly cost them their village. They had helped Suna deal with Iwa. At every step Kanoa had honored its alliances. Now almost every minor village was allied with them. If they won the war with Kumo they would stand at the cusp of being the center of a hegemony that could last for generations. It wasn't a certainty though, since Hai no Kuni was currently leaderless after the brutal assassination of its daimyo. Kanoa had suffered a number of casualties in the war with Iwa and Kumo. If she went all in and joined forces they could win but that also wasn't certain. The Sanan were no pushovers and the next generation of Kanoa had proven equally if not more powerful. Every path I take, even doing nothing, has its risks. Ultimately she was a woman of action. She would not sit on the sidelines. She recalled her counselors and told them her decision. Kirigaku would once more ride the winds of war and she would lead them personally. The advisors who had been so eager to side with Kumo were grinning until she let them know who they would be fighting against. Kiri would not be fighting Konohagaku. No, her village would be allying itself fully with the village hidden in the leaves. Tezuka Yotsuki knew the end was upon Kumo. The last hope of the village had been for Kirigakur to ally with them against Kanoa. Even that may not have been enough, but it would have given them some hope. Terumi had not only shattered their hope by refusing to agree to an alliance, she had buried the shards of it underneath the cruel waves of Kiri. They had allied with Kanoa. They had been quick to prove their allegiance. By sea the fresh Kiri Nin came and conquered. The Rakage had ordered his shinobi to retreat into Kumogaku leaving Kaminari no Kuni, Land of Lightning, to fend for itself. Armed soldiers, typically peasants with spears and bows could not withstand shinobi. After the first few massacres all resistance ended. He was not a man to accept defeat gracefully. 
He knew there was no hope but he would not surrender even should they offer terms. He would rather die on the battlefield. Tezuka had so few Jonan left that all that remained were his guards and one or two clan leaders, but he would not roll over for Kanoa and Kiri. And so he gathered his shinobi, the thousands of Jenin and Chunin ready to die in the face of an unstoppable foe. He still outnumbered the Kiri invasion force by a sizable margin, at least in numbers if not in quality. Mei had come herself but she did not seem interested in taking Kumo with just her forces. Kanoa was on the march. The final insult from Jiraiya. Only 100 shinobi, and with that he wants to eradicate my village. That many shinobi would not be a threat if it wasn't for the fact that it fielded the Kanoa monsters. Team 7, Namikas, Haruno and Uchiha. It was not just them either, the Hokage would spit on Kumogakor's grave personally. As would the Hyuga clan head, Hanata, the would-be kidnapped victim from 14 years ago. It was another deliberate and added slight. Yotsuki took those personally. His plan had been to make them come to him, to fight street by street and house by house in order to inflict as many casualties as possible. Plans changed. He didn't care about bleeding Kanoa, he cared about killing the Hokage. He would lead the assault himself, he would take all of his thousands of weakened half-trained shinobi and strike out at Jiraiya's hundred before they could rendezvous with the Kiri shinobi. My village is doomed, but I'll take you down with me Hokage. Asterisk break asterisk. Shinobi moved quickly and the pace the Kanoa forces kept was substantial, but for the likes of Team 7 and the Hokage it did not even cause a quickening of their breaths. I don't understand why you are willing to give them such generous terms Hokage-sama. Sasuke respectfully commented. If we create onerous terms we will alienate the land for generations. Requiring that they give up the Kinjutsu secrets, changing a few lines on the border and having the rakage step down will cause anger but not long-term frustration. Jiraiya retorted. We will allow them to grow strong again. They are weak because they lack elites, not because they lack shinobi. If we give them even 10 years they will be a threat again. You underestimate just how strong you three are. Jiraiya shook his head. It is still a risk. Do you think they would hold back if they had succeeded in their invasion of our village? I don't and that is why we have war after war after war. It is time to do something different. Jiraiya replied, his tone firm. As the head of the Uchiha clan I strongly urge you to confer with the clan leaders here before offering terms. What makes Kumo any more deserving of mercy compared to Moyagakur, village hidden in the haze? My decision is final Sasuke. The Uchiha nodded and slowed his pace. Jiraiya saw Naruto watching and motioned him over. And what are your thoughts Naruto? Naruto's frog-like eyes did not show much emotion. As they traveled he had stayed in sage mode constantly. Between that and Sasuke's eyes there was no possibility of ambush. It also made him that much harder to read, an already difficult task thanks to Kakashi's training. Sasuke only cares about his comrades and his clan. What he is proposing will make his comrades and his clan safer. That is a narrow view and he is fine with it. However I believe people are important be they from our village or another. I don't want to massacre them. Still, terms that are too generous can be seen as a sign of weakness. Kirigakur will also not have the privilege of looting the wealth of this land, which they are surely expecting as recompense for assisting in the war. Jiraiya frowned. They will be paid with the return of their biju. Naruto didn't give any outward sign of surprise, but despite that Jiraiya knew he had shocked his successor. I won't make the mistake the shot I did and give every village their biju back, but those who have proved loyal like Takagakur and Kirigakur will be rewarded. That should be more than ample payment for Mei's assistance. True. Naruto conceded. It may be arrogant Naruto, but the way you three fight, it is beyond anything I have ever seen. My own team was considered legendary, but we fall well short compared to you. Save for my excellent penmanship and stunning good looks you have surpassed me. Sasuke would annihilate Orokimaru if the old snake was still alive. Soon it has greater chakra reserves and better close combat capability compared to Sakura, however your girl has eclipsed me in Fuenjutsu and her Genjutsu frightens me. He shuddered, only half in jest. No one in the elemental nations can beat you. I am not worried about Kumo regaining their strength as long as you three live. Naruto nodded and then his senses picked up the threat. There are thousands of shinobi heading for us. Either our intelligence was significantly off or they've left their village defenseless. Naruto stated. Jiraiya cursed. 
he couldn't very well ask for a parley, Kumo's stratagem was clear. Defeat the smaller invasion force before the two groups linked. It was not a bold move, it was a desperate one. I'm going to join you in sage mode. Show them your team's power Naruto, but find the rakage. Let him know my terms and get him to surrender. I'll do what I can. Naruto replied and joined his team. Asterisk break asterisk. The rakage had sent hundreds of genin in first. Kanoa had proven their ability to deal wide-scale deaths. He sent out hundreds to the right and the left to circle around very wide in hopes of enveloping Jiraiya and his forces. Chakra gathered overhead, the oppressive presence of it could only herald a single jutsu. Futon, Sora Tonkachi, Wind Release, Sky Hammer, came screaming down onto the Kumo Shinobi who had no defense against it. Only this time the attack was not just the weight of air magnified to a ridiculous degree. With it flecks of black flame came and when the jutsu smashed into the ground it sent the black flames of Amaterasu billowing out in all directions. The main force of Kanoa Shinobi were well away from it but that was not the case for the charging Kumo forces. The genin were annihilated and the charge came to a crashing halt as the flames required his forces to spread out thinly. It was not yet over. The black flames were then fanned into the Kumo Shinobi by a half a dozen Namika's clones who were letting loose with overcharged futon, daytopper, wind release, great breakthrough, jutsu. The fires could not be put out by suit and jutsu, they could only be dodged. Tezuka called for a halt. We'll wait for our forces to surround them before pressing on. He ordered and the courier nin quickly went about signaling and reaching the various field commanders. Several minutes passed by and then the proud rakage could only watch in horror as the hundreds of shinobi on the leftmost flank were annihilated by the strange jutsu of Sasuke Uchiha. The legendary Suzanu carved into the mix of Chunin and Genin. They met the construct with rate and jutsu, kunai and explosive tags that barely inflicted scratches and in return they were met with deaths. Thinking quickly Tezuka ordered his shinobi to charge. The Uchiha could only be in one place at a time and it would take even him some time to fully decimate hundreds of shinobi. They leapt over the still burning black flames or went around them. Before they could close any further Naruto appeared in an orange flash. Tezuka only had a moment to prepare himself and then he and his elite bodyguard were under attack. A wind chakra covered blade sliced straight through one Jonan's blade and bifurcated him. Another of his guard couldn't even get his blade up in time before being skewered by the same blade. The rakage could barely keep up with the pace and what he saw was perfection, there was not a single flaw in Naruto's blade work. Combined with his vastly superior speed and strength he knew he only had seconds before death claimed him. He struck out with a genjutsu that would disorient his opponent's senses and allow time for a strike. His chakra pushed into his foe's chakra network and was instantly dispelled. In a blur Naruto was on him and he dodged to the left to avoid a strike, Naruto sped past and slew his two remaining Jonin guards. One died from a vicious kick that shattered her spine and the other from losing his head. Tezuka Yotsuki, God I'm Rakage of Kumogakur. Our hockage is prepared to allow your surrender with generous terms, stop this madness and see your people live. Tezuka spat on the ground. Kami take you and your hockage. I will not surrender, I will not be paraded about like a trophy. The man, no, the monster before him shook his head. Don't be a fool. You don't stand a chance and your people need not suffer. You'll need to step down as rakage but you won't be paraded around anywhere. Liar. Die. Tezuka had nothing left to lose, he had planned on using the Kinjutsu on Jiraiya but his apprentice would have to do. Raiten, Denku Supido, lightning release, lightning speed. The Kinjutsu flared and the rakage moved faster than he had ever moved before in his life. He was a master in Kenjutsu and now had speed that, for the short time his body could sustain it, could match the Namikas. His opponent didn't seem surprised or troubled by the attack. He parried smoothly and then struck back. Tezuka's own blade hummed with chakra and he prevented the cutting futon covered katana from slicing through. However, while the rakage could match speed he could not match strength. Naruto's blow bowled him over with contemptuous ease. Tezuka felt his skin rip as he plowed through the ground. He flipped up ready for an attack that never came. Last chance, Naruto warned. With an inarticulate cry of rage that belied the stately carriage he had always held himself he blazed forward, intent on killing Naruto with a single blow. Naruto easily parried two strikes and countered with an overhand strike that would smash through the rakage's guard. 
Instead of parrying Tezuka dodged to the right. Naruto used a one-handed parry and with his other hand launched kunai from his palm using his fuinjutsu suit. Only inches away, the kunai burst through the rakage's chest. Naruto saw that the Kumo Shinobi were still fighting and were converging on his position. Kuchio's no jutsu. Summoning technique. The magenta-colored Gamekan appeared in a flash of smoke. Hello Naruto-san. Pardon my clumsiness. Naruto let a ghost of a grin touch his features. Of all the great battle toads Gamekan was his favorite, and for all his supposed clumsiness he was quite the deadly fighter. He directed Gamekan forward as he paused to sense how the rest of the battle was going. Jiraiya had entered Senjutsu mode and between him and Sakura they were dealing with the threat on the flank opposite of Sasuke. I gave it a try Jiraiya, but these shinobi don't look like they want to surrender despite certain deaths. It would be inspiring if it wasn't so pointless. Asterisk break asterisk. Konohamaru stood ready and at attention. The Fuenjutsu suit he wore was custom made for him and as the heir of the Sarutobi clan Sakura had made specific modifications. Not that it appeared that the protections would at all be necessary. Hanabi must have had similar thoughts. Do you think they will even reach us here? Enma, the Monkey King, shook his head. Unlikely, young one. The enemy is already in disarray, the pink one has addled many minds. They fight amongst themselves even as the hockage draws near. Konohamaru huffed a bit. He was good, he knew it. His taijutsu and bojutsu were formidable and he had substantial chakra reserves that would allow him to use cage bunshin and katen ninjutsu very well. Well, if it wasn't for the fact he had to use a huge chunk of his chakra in summoning Enma. That really was the heart of his frustration, the sheer power and presence of the Monkey King was his primary contribution in any fight. Enma fought better than most a ranked Jonan. It rankled his young heart because he too wanted to fight at the center of danger like Naruto did. How was he to learn if he was always being sheltered by his summon? Enma's prediction proved accurate. Perhaps if there were more powerful or experienced opponents they would have more easily seen through the layered genjutsu Sakura had placed over them, however that was not the case. When the Hokage entered the battlefield with his area of effect jutsu the last vestiges of organized resistance ended. Hanabi looked a little green. Unlike Konohamaru she could see everything in perfect detail. How friend slew friend thanks to Genjutsu, how the superheated flames of Jiraiya Sama melted flesh and bone and how the few who had broken out of the Genjutsu had faces slack with disbelief and utter despair. The last images were what would haunt her, the soulless look of helplessness and futility. Konohamaru-kun, even though we may not be needed in these wars I will continue to train. These shinobi had no chance against our forces and I will never let myself be that helpless. The young Sarutobi heir was in perfect agreement. Asterisk break asterisk. Talia, the foremost Sutan user in Kirigakur completed her reported to the Godai Mizukage. Kumogakur has almost no defenders left in the village proper. A massive army led by their rakage is bringing nearly overwhelming numbers to attack the Kanoa forces. Her bodyguard, Chojuro looked pensive. We need to help them. They'll be overwhelmed, they didn't bring that many shinobi with them. Al scoffed, have you not paid attention boy? Kanoa doesn't lose. If the Hokage really is with them you know he'll have brought his elites. We should strike now and prove our loyalty to Kanoa by invading Kumogakur. We have the numbers now and likely the Rakage has his best with him. May could see the logic behind it. It also had the benefit of preventing any unnecessary misunderstandings. Kanoa would likely be wary of another village after what happened with Suna at Omegakur. Tezuka was also renowned for his genjutsu, it would not take much for a genjutsu to lead to infighting between Kanoa and Kiri that would have disastrous consequences. We will attack immediately. I will break any defense they have with Yoten, lava release. Inform the rest of Shinobi. Ao had a wolfish grin as he looked out with his stolen Byakugan. He had been itching for a real fight for years now. The Kiri Shinobi advanced on the doomed village. Asterisk break asterisk. Jiraiya looked at the devastation around him. Not a single Kanoa shinobi had fallen, most hadn't even fought. It had literally been Naruto, Sakura and Sasuke as well as himself that had annihilated the enemy shinobi. It had been a slaughter. In the end some had fled but most had chosen to die. Foolish pride. This wasn't necessary. Sasuke, no doubt, would be happy he thought grimly. He didn't doubt Naruto had given his terms to the rakage, he trusted Naruto to follow his orders. Kami, 
he trusted him to lead the village. Jiraiya reformed his shinobi and continued his march onto Kumogakur only to see smoke rising in the distance. May must have attacked while most of their shinobi were here. The three remaining Team 7 members converged on his location. Naruto, Sasuke, run ahead and see if you can put a stop to the slaughter. Don't start a fight with Kiri, however. The two nodded and they were off. Sakura frowned in his direction. Those two are faster and you know it. Unless they tangle with Mei and her elite there is nothing left that Kumo has to throw at them. Sakura nodded. Her speed and strength were tremendous, borderline S rank in some cases, however her physical abilities paled compared to her genjutsu and fuinjutsu specialties. She knew Jiraiya wanted to preserve life and even if it was just slightly, she would slow them down. What is going to happen after this Hokage Sama? I'll probably hang up my hat soon. Naruto is stronger, faster and has more knowledge thanks to his blatant abuse of Cage Bunshin. I and the council have decided that in Hai no Kuni there will be no separation between Daimyo and Hokage. It will be one position that will unify the country. The one village being part of one nation but not ruling the nation was attempted and while not the cause of the shinobi wars, it did not help matters. This is not the way I would have sought peace and it may or may not work. We'll have to see. Sakura suddenly remembered the mission to the land of waves. She remembered the conversation she had with Kakashi Sensei all those years ago. They camped at night. Kakashi personally set a number of traps as well as cast a genjutsu over them to hide their presence. That done they also set up watches. On the first watch Sakura talked with Kakashi. Kakashi Sensei, does it get easier? Kakashi looked at her, his gaze steady with a hint of compassion in his single visible eye. Yes, killing is something that gets easier over time. You will always remember your first kill but if you have a long and successful career as a shinobi it will become second nature. Sakura was chilled at the thought of being used to killing people. You kill for a reason, to finish the mission. Ultimately the mission is the security of Kanoa. For your parents, your future children, your teammates, fellow shinobi and those who cannot protect themselves. By killing your enemies you keep your village safe, you save lives. Sakura looked like she wanted to say something but Kakashi continued. Sakura, make no mistake, the demon brothers were destined to die the minute they attacked us. The one we left behind for Anbu to pick up will be interrogated and then executed. If you hadn't killed him someone else would have. If you choose to quit the team and stop being a shinobi someone else will fill that role and blood will still be spilled. The copy nin's gaze took on a harsher appearance. A refusal to kill, to not be a shinobi does not lessen killing in the world. It only passes the burden on to someone else. Your squeamishness was a risk for team 7 and you will emerge from this stronger. You are strong enough to bear the burden so someone else doesn't need to. Take pride in that, you bear the sacrifice of the bloody hand so someone else doesn't need to. Sakura thought about her sensei's words. His remarks were perfectly logical and they made sense. But some part of her soul fled from the cold logic that justified the dealing of death. The no longer innocent girl bowed her head, there has to be a better way sensei. Kakashi sighed, I wish there was Sakura but we live in a flawed world. Kakashi then grinned despite of the somber mood. But maybe when your teammate is Hokage he can bring the naive dream that is peace to reality. After all, he is the number one unpredictable ninja. Maybe he'll just surprise us all. Kakashi's grin slowly vanished, not that anyone could really see it behind his mask, and his tone hardened. Until that day comes I expect you to be a shinobi and kill as you are ordered to. Hi Kakashi sensei, Sakura responded. I'll be there for my team. I'll kill when I'm instructed. But there is a better way and this team is going to find it. Sakura promised herself and when her watch came to an end she closed her eyes and went into a dreamless sleep. It had been several long years with dozens of battles since that time. That naive dream could finally become a reality. Her eyes stung just a bit, thinking about the fact that Kakashi Sensei wouldn't be there to see his student become Hokage. It will work Jiraiya Sama, Naruto will make it work. She stated it with utter conviction and Jiraiya felt a sense of peace wash over him. A confidence sprang up, that despite today's tragedy it would birth a better tomorrow. Asterisk break asterisk. Naruto and Sasuke streaked into the village. They moved around the fighting quite easily, Naruto with sage mode and Sasuke with his Sharingan allowing them to avoid pockets of fighting. There really wasn't much fighting, 
What looked like the old and infirm along with academy-aged shinobi were being sorted. They located Mei and rushed to her side. Naturally they were challenged by Kiri Nin as they approached several hundred feet from her. They came to a sudden stop and identified themselves. The shinobi were skeptical of their claim. What proof do you want? Sasuke placidly stared at him, his Sharingan clearly active. More Kiri shinobi were approaching as was Mei herself. Ao called out, they are who they say they are. At that Mei moved to approach but her bodyguards closed ranks and she shot them irritated looks. I doubt they are here to assassinate me, we are allies. She told her shinobi sharply. Chojuro lowered his blade sheepishly while Ao and Talia kept the guard up. If we were here to kill you there is little they could do to stop us. Sasuke stated with his typical arrogance. Naruto whacked him on the shoulder. This is a meeting between friends. He turned toward the Mizukage. May Sama I bring a message from the Hokage. Kumogakur is finished and he would like the loss of life to stop. Withdraw your shinobi and end the fighting. I don't have a true quarrel with Kumo, I merely acted to show the seriousness with which I take the friendship between our two villages, she replied looking Naruto in the eyes. He graciously smiled. Hi, I understand. Konohagakur appreciates your efforts and will do everything we can to ensure a long and fruitful friendship between our two villages. Mei gave her orders to her shinobi and the Kirigakur forces raced to obey. Naruto could sense that many of the Kiri shinobi were frightened. Mei on the other hand was completely unflappable, she was worthy of the title Mizukage. His gut told him that she would be happy with a lasting peace and alliance between their two villages. It was an auspicious start. The minor villages were already behind Kanoa, with the relatively strong Kiri village also with them Naruto could not see where any nation could realistically threaten them. Now we just have to figure out what we want to do about sooner. Asterisk break asterisk. Kankuro was quite nervous about meeting the Kanoa shinobi. Last time he was face to face with them he had been trying to kill them. It hadn't ended well. It isn't a good idea for the Kazekage to be as nervous as a genin, get it together. He was worried about his own life of course. Now as the cage of his village he had even more of a burden on his shoulders. Only a small guard was with him in order to better show their intention of coming peacefully. Altogether they were a little over a half dozen shinobi, all of them laden with the jutsu of the village. Secrets that no shinobi outside of their village had ever learned, now to be given freely to Kanoa. If it had only been that Kankuro would have been a happy man. Sadly it was not, his sensei, Baki, had felt a greater gesture needed to be made. Apparently that traitor, Yura, had not been acting on orders from sooner. Kankuro had been grateful that his sister and former sensei had not gone off the deep end when it came to Kanoa, but fixing the mess Yura had caused was going to be a monumental undertaking. They are here, one of his guards told him. Kankuro felt the chakra around him and a dozen masked shinobi in the Kanoa Fuenjutsu suits appeared around his small party. Jiraiya himself arrived shortly afterward. As had been discussed previously Kankuro and all of his guards dropped to their knees and completed the dogeza. Kankuro lifted his face from the ground and held out the box he had been carrying. We have failed to honor our alliance properly. It was the act of traitors and yet we still carry the burden. To make up for our failure we are giving you our entire library of jutsu as well as this final gift representing how critical we view the friendship between our villages to be. Jiraiya took the box and opened it. He revealed the head of Baki, the former Kazekage of Sunagakur. His brow furrowed. We would not have asked this of your village. Kankuro didn't move a muscle other than to speak. Baki sensei did not want to take any chances. I've seen your power. Your village could obliterate ours and there would be nothing we could do about it. He died hoping that his act would make amends for our failures. Jiraiya exhaled heavily. Stand up. You are friends and allies, not servants and supplicants. Return to your village, there will be no retaliation from us Kankuro. I will not be Hokage for much longer but my student is of like mind. May you rule with wisdom Kazekage. With that three of Anbu masked Fuenjutsu wearing leaf nin and the Hokage himself disappeared in a cloud of smoke. They had all been using cage bunshin. The remaining Anbu masked individual were likely also clones but they did not disappear as they carried the secrets of Suna with them. Kankuro breathed a sigh of relief. Kanoa didn't trust them but they were willing to let bygones be bygones. His village and his people would survive. He had not been grandstanding or making baseless flattery. 
he had seen the monsters of Team 7 fight. Naruto, the future Hokage had even more power than his younger brother had ever wielded, but unlike Gara, he wasn't insane. Kankuro would always be wary of Kanoa and would do everything in his power to make sure Sunagakura would always stay on the good side. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.